<laughs> for me, it was whoever was playing Prince. I, I had to rewind like well, six it, times. It was a great performance. It's such a small moment, but he gives it such a brilliant moment. <laughs> yeah. He really wants that award. I feel really. Yeah, yeah that, that very specific <laughs> award. Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Janelle Riley from Variety. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce actor Daniel Radcliffe. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Thank you for having me. I don't, actually don't know if it's morning where you are, and I don't know if it's morning where everyone else is watching, but it's morning for me. I guess it's afternoon here now, technically, but it's, you know, I feel like good morning is acceptable till very, I'm doing a play at the moment. So good morning can be true up until like seven o'clock at night. <laughs> Um, this is an audience of your fellow SAG after actors. And so I usually like to start by asking people, how did they get their SAG card? And this might be unusual for you because you were working in the UK for yeah. a while. I'm, I, I'm very curious, actually, when you did get your SAG card. I guess it would have been on Kill Your Darlings, which is my first like film over here. Because, um, yeah, I would have been, I'm sure... Because I would have been uh, when I'm doing theater, that would have been a different thing. So yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it would have been Kill Your Darlings, um, which was like you know, uh, which is a very special job to me for many reasons, but <laughs> mostly because I met my girlfriend on that, who I'm still with. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's I and also just like a film that I loved. That was only like ten years ago. Yeah, a lot um, of movies before that. I know. Yeah. It's, I, as you say, it was just not, I, I sort of had a very unusual, obviously entrance into the industry. Um, and so I was just sort of, uh, doing these movies before I knew what a sack card or many other things were. <laughs> uh, well, again, congratulations on weird, the Al Yankovic story. Um, I'm going to assume everyone watching this has seen it because I have to get, I have to talk about specific scenes because I love this movie so much. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll, maybe I'll try to be as vague as possible, but there's, I mean, a yeah, <laughs> I, I, I tend to, it's a hard film to talk about and not talk about specifics. So <laughs> yeah. I will also be spoiling things. I'm sorry to anyone who hasn't seen it. And if you haven't seen it, stop and go watch it right <laughs> now, because I was just saying that like, there's a, there's a scene with Jack Black that I laughed at for 20 minutes straight, even yeah. though the scene is only three minutes, I kept <laughs> laughing for 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was definitely one of the. One of the many insane cameos on this film, but particular, I made Jack Black. Jack Black was off cam doing off camera stuff for me at one point where I was um, on, and I made him like laugh at something, and just the the child in me who had like was who was just a gigantic fan of his was. Uh, I was just like, I I can I can die happy now. I can just go home. This is great. I was wondering how many takes were ruined by people laughing on this movie. <laughs> Not probably too many, honestly, because there was also, I always think that the thing that will keep me from breaking more than anything else is fear. Um, and is fear of like screwing up somebody else's take or like another, but you know, you know, something like that. Um, and I think that was on a, on a set where we would, you know, it was a very, very tight shoot and we were, you know, we generally were not going for more than like two or three takes. So you didn't want to, if you were laughing through one of them, you had probably just ruined one of your chances to get the scene. Um, so that, that kind of kept me, uh, but Yorma, Yorma Zirconi as, as Pee Wee uh, broke me a lot just because he can make me laugh doing anything. For me, it was whoever was playing Prince. I, I had to rewind like well, six times. <laughs> It was a great performance. It's such a small moment, but he gives it such a brilliant moment. <laughs> yeah. He really wants that award. I feel really. Yeah. yeah that, that very specific award. <laughs> um, it's funny because you're not necessarily the first actor who springs to mind when casting Weird Al. I, I honestly don't know who would be. Um, and yet this works so well. Uh, were you a fan of his work prior to playing him? I was um, actually, again, really through my girlfriend. We um, So I, I had kind of known some of his stuff growing up and had liked it um but was not kind of you know did not have like an encyclopedic knowledge of it or anything and then when i started dating erin and i met her family like they are all huge weird al fans who have been to multiple i think 
I, they will be. I mean, I don't even know how many her dad would have been to. Her brother's been to like five concerts. Erin's been to about three. Um, and they were all huge fans. And Al became like the the soundtrack of a lot of our like road trips or Christmas when we were around theirs. Uh, so I got to know it very, very quickly and very well and very, and very quickly like moved beyond the hits and into like, Oh, these are the, some of the, like the original songs and the, the stuff that people don't know as much, but are kind of lyrically some of the most exciting stuff that he does. Um, so yeah, I, I became a very, very big fan. So, but also had the same reaction, you know, when when they approached me to do it, my first reaction was that I'm I am not knowing a bit about Al as I do. I am not the first person I would think of uh to play it. Um and then as soon as I like read the script, I literally as soon as I got to the first or second page, and you see the, you know, the grizzled narrator's voiceover and the the you you get immediately like, oh right, okay. It's very it's very clear immediately what this is. And so then it was really exciting because then I was like, oh, this is they have created a world in which I can play weird house legitimately. Um and like how uh, how cool and exciting is that? Also, I mean, you can't really say no. Your your girlfriend's family would be so upset. Yeah. I could never have faced them again. I mean, I just never would have told them that it would have been like I, I would have had to just keep that a secret to my deathbed. I was curious because um, I know the script is by Yankovic himself and Eric Appel. Yeah. Um, did they give you a heads up that it wasn't a traditional biopic? It was more of like sort of a parody of traditional biopics. So you just start reading and like, you know, there's there's the father who lost his hand in the mystery factory. And yeah. like, at what point did you realize? Oh, OK. Wait. I mean, I, it, it really did, it made itself pretty, there was no, the log line was very much just like biopic of Weird Al Yankovic and his rise to fame. Um, and so I was like, it, there was no clues in that and, and no, and I hadn't spoken to Eric and, um, and Al before, so I didn't have a hint about it, but it did, it was, it was very evident very quickly um, that it wasn't a, that we would dealing with like tropes um, of the biopic genre. And uh, that's, that's what the thing was going to be. Um, and then when I talked to them about it, and that was what was so exciting about the script, because you can read a good script uh, or you can read a script that sets up a great premise. And then if, if it, does that then for me the question is like how fully does it then explore that premise and how much can it get out of it and find in it um and this just does that brilliantly like it is it so fully explores the tropes of like musical biopics but also just like biopics in general um and yeah, the sort of to use a a, a, a slightly annoying word now like the synergy of like weird al and what he is and what he has done for his whole career with that idea was just like, this is so perfect. It took me a couple more pages for it to click for me. It's when Thomas Lennon shows up with the accordion and they yes. just like start ridiculously beating him that I was like, okay, I get it. I didn't know um, when I was doing the film that the voiceover was going to be done by someone else. So I, I like, I went up to Eric at one point, I was like midway through filming. I was like, so for this voiceover, you, you, you project, you, you're thinking just like the graveliest thing I can muster. And he was like, Oh no, 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 you're not doing it. It's, it's Dietrich Bader. It's like the voice of Batman is doing that voiceover. And I was like, ah, that's, brilliant again and like a joke that i hadn't seen was there but is yeah just brilliant sorry i got off track there because i got distracted by the voiceover story what were we saying we we're talking about thomas lennon's scene thomas where, oh, no, that, a moment where he sells um, the accordion because it's all that's a great example of a moment in the film that is toying with the truth and then just going insane because it is one of the hilariously true things is that al did start playing accordion after being sold one by a door-to-door salesman um and so a guy really did come to his house with one his father did not then beat him half to death but there's up and i'd say for like the first third of the film particularly you can e even some of the more insane moments can are often rooted in some truth and then after after that point it just goes completely off the rails I was sort of curious about that because the film is so absurd but it's going to sound weird but the jokes aren't really played as jokes can no, you sort of yeah. talk about finding and then keeping that tone? Yeah, look, that's all um, down to Eric Appel. That was something that he talked about from our 
absolutely like first meeting and something that he I feel like had to finesse throughout the whole film is finding those insane jokes in there because obviously the story is insane some of the jokes are absolutely nuts but it doesn't it, for what he's doing to for what he's trying to do which is like parody this very like self-serious genre um it has to be played with that sort of straightness and he was really kind of and there are some like there's a you know there's the uh there's one shot in the first trailer of like accordions kind of coming up like being uh give, thrust at me from all angles and you know that's not in the movie because it just it felt slightly too crazily of a you know of a different th- uh thing um which i found really you know i i found really interesting to watch eric like yeah craft this really really specific tone um and it's also it's great because it's it's sort of me evan rain uh toby and juliana all we're all playing it quite straight and then that allows some of the other people to be like crazier in what they're doing and sort of um but yeah it's uh it was a really interesting thing to what i'm glad i did not have the responsibility of crafting that tone because it seems really specific and kind of um nuanced but he did uh, an amazing job yeah i wonder how much of that was found in editing did like he let you do several takes uh well actually you said you didn't really have time to do a lot of takes we didn't do a lot but we would you know i think all of us know enough to know like oh if we if you just want to like go back and do it again within the same take a couple of times to like give more options like we we all found like ways of we you know we 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 got it in but so there was there was but there also there wasn't a ton of like improvising or alternate versions it was really like eric wrote uh, eric and al wrote a really really tight script and I, yeah, I, and, and for the most part, it was just like, can we execute this and like film it in time? Yeah, I can't ima- I imagine improvising would be hard to come up with anything crazier than what they wrote. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was like, there, I'm sure there was a bit like Rain probably did a bit. Um, but no, I feel like for the, for the most part, we were just like, we were sticking to it or I was. And then occasionally Eric would like, or Al would shout out like alts or other things that they'd suddenly thought of. But yeah, it was, it was mostly just the script. So once you decided to take the role on, how do you go about preparing to play? I don't want to say Weird Al. You're playing Weird Al, but really this heightened version of him. Um, but yeah. still, you have to prepare. And and you know, did you did you actually learn to play the the accordion, aka the devil's squeeze box? That's yeah. a hard instrument. It is. Um, and yes, I did. Um, I tried anyway. Yeah, as you say, there's not. I'm not really preparing to play like the real Al. Um, and so I, that was that sort of lifted some like obviously I had watched, you know, UHF and I'd watched a bunch of his music videos and it was familiar with sort of steeping myself in that sort of stuff and and his before particularly his live performances, actually. Um, but other than that, I think my most of my prep for the film was learning the accordion, which strictly speaking, nobody asked me to do. Um, They were very much like, we don't expect you to be able to do that. And I, you know, absolutely can't. Um, But I would have felt so lazy. I'm like, if I'm, I've got a few months to go before we start shooting, what else am I going to do? But try and learn as much of the accordion as I can. So I had, um, very luckily, I had a friend who is a self-taught accordion player um and he um excuse me uh and he like gave me lessons and made these amazing like animations to try and help me learn uh the sort of four songs i have to play in the movie not with the ex- expectation that i'd ever be able to properly play them but with the hope that i could at least have my hands in the right place so that eric would not have to like shoot around me so much and just like shoot around my hands and and all of that stuff um so there was a fair amount of accordion learning which was so i i've this year i've had to do that and also for the musical that i'm doing have had to uh learn certain like patterns on a typewriter um so my girlfriend's year has been really like just horrible in terms of what she's been listening to um and other than that it was but again because of how quick the shoot was um 
just sort of getting the choreography as early as I could and the uh like the fight choreography when I arrived in LA and we were doing like the pre-production I was learning sort of what that was um again just to make things all run as smoothly as possible kind of on the day wow um I want to talk about the physical transformation because you can do all this prep but how much does it help to put on that wig and those glasses and especially the Hawaiian shirt and is that when you really feel your owl <laughs> kind of yeah and then people start like sort of reacting to you differently I think that's a part of it as well but yeah I loved like I loved I really loved the look um I loved having the mustache um I loved the glasses um the hair you know I wish my hair did that it it won't yeah, I could grow it as long as I want obviously it would not look like that um but yeah it is uh and actually having the accordion I do think like being being in that costume and then getting the accordion on and being able to play a little bit of something did really I am you know by no means uh a method actor um and uh, but just there is something very helpful sometimes when you look in the mirror and just see something so like alien and different that it kind of frees you up to be something else as well um so yeah it was it was really fun having all that stuff on the and and also just to say costume and makeup on this film generally were just unbelievable like the the pool party scene that you you referenced earlier like the amount of like the amount of people they had to get through hair and makeup that day uh, with no time and, you know, all of them coming out looking amazing. Um, yeah, just uh, a, a, a heroic effort. Uh, we talked a little bit about all the amazing cameos uh, in the film, um, but you also have a scene with Weird Al himself. And he's a yeah. good actor, by the way. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I love working with, I loved working with him in those scenes. Yeah, what was he like as a scene partner? He was great. I mean, he was, he was really, really fun and just like getting to do a scene yeah, the the bizarreness, I mean, and the street was filled with moments like these, I suppose, but of just being dressed as him, getting to do a scene, playing him in front of him as he tells me that parody songs are going to be unsuccessful forever. It was just so, it was great. And it was also, because the first day, that was our second day of shooting, was filming the Al stuff in the office with obviously the brilliant Will Forte as well. Um, and it, I feel like that just those scenes really set the tone for the like subtly strange thing we're doing in the film. Cause the first scene's obviously him listening to Will berate me and insult him at the same time. <laughs> it, I just love, I love that in the script. Just because it came with the note of just like note Tony Scotty is played by the real Al Yankovic. Um, and then the second scene was the scene where I end up putting the, cigarette out in Will's hand um and it was just all so like strange and it's and they they kind of represent two very different like Al's like the, the the scene where I put the cigarette out is like the first scene after the LSD trip where Al has kind of become like mean Al suddenly um and uh yeah I I just it was they were very very fun to do yeah watching Will Forte tell you how ugly you are <laughs> well, like, yeah, he did that he started one of the things that definitely wasn't I mean you know it's great was uh he's he he started doing like a vomit a vomiting thing uh, as well just after he just like is looking at me that was one of the I think you can maybe see me just like turn away from camera in that moment in the film because I'm laughing I that's I don't know how you did it I would have ruined every single time <laughs> What was it like for you, though, the first time you did see yourself in the hair and makeup? Because you, you, in a way, you kind of don't need to look that much like him because it is this loose parody, but you really do. Thanks. I mean, it's it's interesting because there's like a range of uh, responses to I think some people are like, you kind of really look like him and it's surprising. And there's people that are like, you don't look like him, but it doesn't matter. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I kind of, I think there's like, I think there's there's a lot that Al and I are similar in, but it's more in just like the way we, I think the energy we have is quite similar um, than any sort of physical uh, resemblance. Cause they're, they're, you know, I think um, like I, when we were doing press together, I actually was when I noticed it, which is that we both have a kind of, we're both like really kind of 
bolt still when we're listening and then incredibly moving all over the place when we're talking. So there are just like, there's things that I, I think I, I naturally come by that are, are similar energetically at least. I sometimes worry about actors when they're playing really serious roles or doing difficult scenes. And I just think it would be really fun to play Al because he's so joyous. I mean, that's the whole film was was joyous. Like it was a uh, even on the the days where we were filming like intense or weird scenes or whatever, it was still like everyone felt so happy to be there. There was nobody on the crew or the cast that was like indifferent to Al. Everyone like was a fan and loved him and he was there every day. So it just, it felt incredibly joyous and lucky to be getting to make this thing. And that's, I think that's what's been so lovely about what's happened to it since it's come out is that, you know, I love pretty much, everything I ever do you know I I you you end up feeling like an immense like love for the people you made it with and and for the thing itself um and then it goes into the world and like sometimes people just are like oh it's fine and that's always so that when you get to do one that's like that seems to be received with as much love as you had for it when you were making it it's just it yeah it's we're, we're we're all feeling very very lucky well, you have made some really unpredictable choices in your career. I mean, you've played everything from a dead body to a man who grows horns. Yeah. <laughs> what generally draws you to a role? I mean, now, I mean, what, one of the reasons I did weird, other than the the script and everything else about it, was it was so evidently going to be fun. Um, you know, and that's a huge thing now for me. It's like, am I going to have a good time doing this? And I don't mean by that that the role shouldn't be hard or require a lot or be grueling in some way um because that can be that's its own sort of fun challenge too but it's it's most about like who am i making this with am i going to make this with people that i want to spend because i don't you know i don't watch the films i make back like i'll net once we're done with it we're done with it and i'm not re- probably ever going to watch it again so the only thing you're left with is the experience you had making it so i, I really believe that's got to be that's got to be good um and yeah so that's it's first and foremost like do i think i'll i'll enjoy this and if it look if there's a weird cool uh, premise that i have not seen or expected then that is definitely that's always very exciting but i do like to point out as well that i do i have made films that are like na- grounded and naturalistic <laughs> they just um they they just get broken up by the films where i've got like guns for hands or i'm a dead body um so there's there's been a lot of that too but i'm very I'm, i do feel really lucky to i think there's a thing that happens as well which is that when you start doing um you know weird movies or you see you can't use the word weird weird anymore now that i'm promoting <laughs> the movies. um but if i you know the films that sort of get termed unusual they sort of just beget more of the same so people are like oh you like interesting strange stuff well here's more of it and some of it's terrible and then but occasionally amazing well i mean horns despite the fact that you do grow horns is very grounded and very much about grease yes, that's true actually yeah it is i, I love that movie it's it's yeah. uh, it seems to really like split people i guess in the end but i i think it's such a cool film and like alex asher is such a a wonderful director um that yeah i and that and it exists in a real magical realism just like very very grounded but insane things happening yeah and even Woman in Black, that's, you know, pe- the, the horror genre kind of gets dismissed. But but that is like that's a that's a wrenching role. Yeah. I mean, that that film is all about grief. Yeah, it's a, a amazing horror film. I mean, the director of that film talked a lot at the time about how all ghost stories are inherently consoling because they imply an afterlife. Um, but it's also it's a very it's a it's a it's a rough way to get there in that film. It's it's Yeah. It's so funny. Someone just said that the other day and I don't find it consoling because I find the idea of this just never ends. That I is pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. I don't know if you got to see your co-star Tom Felton in 222, A Ghost Story. Oh, no. Yeah. That's it's very it's it deals with those topics. And it's oh, very really? Oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, I was very happy he did it. I saw him not long ago and we were talking about how much he'd loved doing it. Uh, but no, yeah. I've been over, I've been in New York for a while. Well, hopefully it'll come to New York. Oh, wow. Okay. That would be awesome. Yeah. Talk of that. Yeah. Oh, great. (laughs) Um, So aside from not laughing and ruining takes, what ended up being the most challenging part of making the film? 
I think it was just the, the sheer amount of scripts we had to do and and how big some of the sequences needed to feel in order for it to feel like the things that it was parodying. Um, and they ended up, they turned out amazing, but all the stuff in uh, Joe Robbie Stadium, so the performances of uh, Like a Surgeon and... Uh, the the sort of eat it performance that goes terribly wrong. Uh, those, uh, you know, they were big, big numbers. Um, and that was a big day of filming. So like that was just, uh, I, I, but I feel like they were mostly, they were mostly kind of the, the logistical and time challenges were the challenges that we were coming up against, but they were kind of always being solved by our amazing first AD, um, uh, Emily Newman. And then uh, just also, frankly, the, the the whole crew and the cast, like nobody came in, you know, nobody came in and was like, oh, this is going a bit fast or created a problem or everyone just got in and saw what it was and just worked incredibly hard. Um so, I mean, I, I'm sure Eric would say there were many, many other challenges that he as the director was aware of that I was not. Um, but yeah, it was, from my eyes, it was just like the amount we had to do every day. I always think about how one role often informs another, whether it's just getting experience. But um, you've done a musical before, How to Succeed in Business Without Really yeah. Trying. Forgive me if you've done another one since then. I mean, no, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing, doing yeah. no, no, not in between. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was able to see that. And I, first of all, the stamina, I don't know how you did some of those numbers. <laughs> um, do you think that that in some ways helped prepare you for weird? Definitely. I mean, doing How to Succeed was one of the has prepared me for so much of what's come since honestly but having the sort of confidence in my ability to because i had told myself a story about myself which is that i couldn't really like dance or move or do any of that sort of stuff um and having that so thoroughly dispelled by evidence like i can't say that to myself anymore like i have danced so, like i know i'm not an, an amazing natural dancer like who's going to pick up choreography immediately but if you give me time and I and think I can learn it and I will you know and, and I will do that um and so I think having the that ability has made me more confident in my ability to learn that stuff quickly and also I'll on on Potter you know I was training with the stunt department every you know three times a week probably um, for most of those films and a friend of mine there called Davey who I was still I'm very close to um but he would do all this like fight choreography stuff with me at lunch and so I, I did feel like between that and how to succeed and the, the comedy of how to succeed which I feel like started me doing getting better at comedy because doing comedy in front of a live audience is so such an education about learning what works and why it works and what doesn't and all of those things. Um, so yeah, one of the things about weird that was so thrilling was that I did feel like I was getting to pull from all these different skill sets that I accu uh, like accrued on different things and was able to like, use them all on this job. Um, so yeah, it would, that it made it really just like exciting to, I'm feeling like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, you know, yeah, it just makes it very fulfilling. I can't believe you ever thought you couldn't sing and dance because I saw how to succeed in business. It's been 10 years and I'm still exhausted from watching you in Brotherhood of Man. I mean, yeah, I'm still exhausted <laughs> from doing it. Um, yeah, it, it, no, that was it was amazing. I loved that so much. There's not unfortunately, there's not nearly as much dance uh, in, in the show that I'm doing now, but it's still it's exhausting in its own way. So, yeah, it's um, but I, 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 I like being there's something nice about being like pushed really hard by something because it sort of, it lowers all you, because people can, I think there's something thrilling about watching that, particularly on stage. There's uh, something thrilling about watching like all these other dancers. You're like, oh yeah, you're amazing. You're really good at this. That guy might break, but he's doing, but he's doing it. Like, I think that makes it something quite exciting. And you're, so you're doing Merrily We Roll Along now. That is, that's through January? Yeah. Through January wow. 21st, I think. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> and hopefully, if if it goes well, hopefully we get to do it again next year. Um, I, but we'll we'll wait we'll wait and see if it. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, that's that's fingers crossed. Oh, okay. Because I'm trying to get out there to to see some things before they close, and everything's to be seems to be having such a short run right now. So um, yes, and this 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 one is 
uh, tickets are very, I, I'm having to tell friends, like, I don't know, man, I don't know if I can get you in. It's, uh, it's, it's very well sold, which is, which is great, but hopefully there'll be another chance for people to see it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I hear it's amazing. So, um, well, again, I want to remind everyone watching that weird is on the Roku channel. You can watch it. You watch it again and again, like I have, or you can just rewatch the ending several times for the scene with Prince which is also yeah. worth it. <laughs> and and, uh, and you got to watch the film, really, so you can listen to the credit song, which is the best credit song I think there's ever been. It's very good. <laughs> um, I also just love the the bar heckling scene with Pat Oswalt. Oh, so good. Yeah, I love, I love Pat Oswalt. I love got, getting to see him on this as well. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, thank you so much for sharing your experiences, process, and craft with your fellow performers. Thank you oh. so much for being here. Thank you so much, Janelle. Thank you for talking to me. Of course.